Newcastle city centre has been, for centuries, the retail capital of the North East, rivalled only by the out-of-town shopping within the metro centre in Gateshead. In fierce rivalry, Newcastle also developed an indoor mall in the form of Eldon Square, demolishing blocks of Richard Grange's sandstone buildings for a modernist mall. This competition to be the retail capital was a finite race. The future of retail in UK cities is turbulent. The current rendition of the High Street is within a period of flux. Whether the High Street as we know it will continue to exist in the coming decades is uncertain. Shopping malls are in a especially precarious place as buildings solely dedicated to commerce. But Newcastle has had a long history of failed malls and shopping centres. I'm going to explore the rise and fall of Newcastle's lost malls. What better place to start than Richard Grange's Royal Arcade, which could be argued as the first indoor shopping centre in the city. Grangertown is Newcastle's historic heart, a sandstone commercial centre built within a street plan weaved in between Newcastle's medieval streets. Whilst much of this is successful and has survived to this day, some parts of Richard Grange's vision was lost. One of these was an arcade. The Royal Arcade was located some distance away from the shops and retail core of Newcastle. This peripheral location was meant to be chosen due to the idea that this part of the city would soon expand. However, when this expansion never happened, the arcade was left on a limb. By 1860, just 30 years after it opened, the post office here closed and the place was in decline. This decline would continue for decades. The first talk about the demolition of the Royal Arcade originated in 1927 with a soon to be completed Time Bridge now connecting in with Pilgrim Street. The amount of traffic heading along this route would be vastly increased. At the time, a route was being considered for a new bypass which would result in the demolition of this building. However, the Royal Arcade clung on and no progress was made on this new bypass. In 1935, the idea of improving traffic flow in this part of the city was floated again. The central arcade was considered to be standing in the way of traffic flow. A much less grand scheme than the aforementioned bypass was proposed. This included a series of junction improvements which would have caused the Royal Arcade to be demolished. This project too never left the ground. In the 1960s, there were further concerns of the growth of motor cars and the impact this was having on traffic flow within the city centre. The solution chosen at the time was the construction of a city centre motorway to relieve the historic street pattern. A notoriously bad part of the road system was a junction to the north of the Time Bridge, where Pilgrim Street met City Road. This is where the city's main north and southbound traffic was met by one of the main routes to the east of the city. Traffic through the centre of Newcastle faced further issues as well. With the Great North Road running up Newcastle's main shopping street, the solution at the time was a tangled knot of new motorways, bridges and roundabouts, aiming to solve traffic. Known as the Central Motorway, Alderman Donald D. Gilbert, at the time the chairman of Newcastle's Traffic, Highways and Transport Committee, said, the city's engineers department have worked hard for many years to keep one step ahead of Newcastle's traffic problems. Both they and my committee feel that we are implementing the correct solutions. The route of the Central Motorway East has been carefully chosen with a view to minimising inconvenience to all concerned. Finally, in 1963, after years of planning, work finally started on a new roundabout at the southern end of Pilgrim Street and the Time Bridge. This was a key part of the Central Motorway. In order to facilitate this development, the Royal Arcade would need to be demolished. However, the building was not going to be lost forever. The original proposal for Swan House Roundabout was to rebuild the arcade in the centre of this, connecting in to the office scheme above. Piece by piece, the Royal Arcade was taken apart and placed in the area now known as City Stadium with the intention of rebuilding this at a later date. 
I'm sitting in the Royal Arcade in Newcastle. It's another slice of Ranger and Dobson. It was put up with a very formal entrance at the end of Mosley Street and Pilgrim Street. And behind that, they had a deep passage, two stories, top lit, like so many of the arcades in London. It never really worked because it was intended to connect up with more of the town at the eastern end, and that never caught on. So it was always a kind of dead end. It was always in trouble, first of all in commercial trouble, and then in trouble because it was in the way. And now it's in real trouble, because look at it. See, what happened was, Newcastle said, fine, the Royal Arcade's got to go. We've got to have a roundabout in Pilgrim Street, but we'll take it down carefully, we'll store the stones, number them, and then put it up again somewhere else. And that's fine. That's what Newcastle's about, this reuse and everything, you know, going on over and over again. But not like this. This is just like a bomb site. It's a bit of slum clearance. The stones are anyhow. Anyone can get at them. I think the numbers are slowly wearing off because it look as, looks as though with the rain you have in Newcastle that the actual paint is wearing away. So we've been conned. Newcastle's been conned. I've been conned myself. However, the Royal Arcade was never rebuilt using its original masonry. Instead, a wood and plaster replica was rebuilt in a space underneath Swan House. This was used as a parade of shops, now converted into the Purple Peacock as an entertainment venue. You can hardly tell this is meant to be a replica of Granger's Arcade now. But what happened to the masonry pieces in the Royal Arcade? Some of the masonry and stone pieces were then scattered through Heaton Park as follies, where they can still be found to this day. Constructed in 1906 by George Handyside, who died before its completion, the Handyside Arcade was a 90-unit shopping arcade. Its mainstream commercial success was never fully realised and never took off in the way it was intended to, but it eventually had a renaissance as a centre for youth culture, which this film will not do justice. What was unique about the Handyside Arcade was it became an alternative shopping centre. No chain stores were located here. In 1986, a newspaper article highlighted that a footbridge connecting Eldon Square to the Handyside Arcade could benefit both. However, this article also included references to turning the arcade into a department store. This plan would never be fully realised. However, the idea of a footbridge connecting these two sites would not be dropped. A later newspaper article talks of the final days of the Handyside Arcade with tenants given their final notice. It partly blames the closure on the free and excessive parking available at the newly opened Metro Centre. We wouldn't have got permission for this sort of scheme prior to the Metro Centre. However, an arcade along the lines of the Handyside Arcade aims at a different type of shopper than those going for the chain stores and out of town mall. The Handyside Arcade was demolished in 1987 to make way for the Eldon Garden shopping complex. Newcastle Council at the time supported this redevelopment. The new shopping centre would contain 500 car parking spaces and 50 shop units, aiming to open in 1988. This would feature a footbridge across Percy Street, similar to the one discussed in 1986. Not everything on the site was demolished to make way for Eldon Garden. The Three Bulls Heads, a pub on the site, was retained, and the shopping centre was built around this. This pub still remains as part of this development. The replacement development known as Eldon Garden would have a turbulent history itself. This was never the commercial success it was planned to be. The bridge over Percy Street creates a dark and dingy street below. The rear of Eldon Garden creates another uninviting side of this development, turning its back on the rest of the city. But the interior of this, upon opening, was light and airy and well designed, it featured a central atrium with two floors of shops located around this. Further retail units could be found externally fronting 
Percy Street, its iconic footbridge would feature further shops and tie this into the existing Eldon Square shopping centre. In 2004, an extension was added to Eldon Garden. This features a completely different architectural style to the original, boasting an opening lineup of a Sony shop and a Lakeland. The ground floor units would later be occupied by a Tesco and an entrance to a gym. This is probably the most successful part of Eldon Garden. This area is now on a limb, with very few shops actually active in the shopping centre. The future of Eldon Garden is not certain. This is a major spot in the city centre that could be put to much better use. If the footbridge here was demolished, this would vastly improve the appearance of Percy Street. A better use of this space would be for residential use with retail units at the ground floor. However, in order to achieve this, it would most likely require a complete demolition of Eldon Garden. The managing director Howard Dawson in 2018 said this in regard to Eldon Garden's decline. There has been a steady decline in trading in Eldon Garden over many years and we've been badly affected by decisions that have been taken by the council in their various capacities, including highways, car park management, planners, adjoining retail. What is more likely the reason for its decline is the Edges Centre location, the lack of an anchor store and the outdated design of the mall, with this being inward facing and not connecting well to its surrounding streets. This is all furthered by an oversupply of retail units in this part of the city centre. If the Handyside Arcade was still here today, and renovated, it's likely it would be similar to Leeds Historic Arcades, which are still successful to this day. The current site of the Muldron Hotel in Newcastle has changed repeatedly over the years, from a Victorian theatre to an 85 bedroom hotel and shopping centre opening 1969. The shopping centre had approximately 20 stores as well as a nightclub. The Swallow Hotel and shopping centre was designed in a brutalist architectural style. This would eventually have to compete with the much larger Eldon Square shopping centre that opened in 1976. This competition and the Swallow's location to the south of Newcastle's main retail core likely led to its demise. Its design of featuring shops within a central indoor area, whilst novel at the time, became less inviting, with no major footfall heading through this. The Swallow Hotel and Shopping Centre were finally demolished in 2016. This was replaced by the more modestly designed Muldron Hotel, with 265 rooms and Newgate Court student accommodation also attached. Whilst this fits in much better with the surrounding streets of Grangetown, I'm never fond of some of the angles of this building, which look a bit rubbish, as well as the choice of materials, a sandstone-esque cladding, which at least fits the surrounding streets but it's now ageing really poorly on its northern elevation. The circus of streets surrounding Grey's Monument is the centre point of Newcastle city centre. This prominent position was once the site of a mall that technically still exists, but in a vastly altered state. Monument Mall opened in 1992 on the site of the former post office and office block. This pastiche design aims to blend in with Grey Street and Granger Street, evoking a replica of Tyneside classical architecture. But behind this is actually in fact a modern building with a steel frame 
dressed to look older. The crowning feature of this is a glass dome, which originally served as the food court and central atrium. As part of the construction of the mall, three listed facades were retained and incorporated in as part of the design. At the point of opening, 95% of the mall's stores were let. One of the major anchor stores within this development was the four-story Virgin Records Megastore. Monument Mall was linked underground to the Monument Metro Station Ticket Hall, which is located beneath Gray's Monument. This allowed direct access into the mall without the need to go outside. In the early 2010s, declining footfall and a loss of number of shops led to a major refurbishment. The four-storey centre had suffered from being wrong-sized for many retailers looking for space in the city. The conversion was finally undertaken by local architects Faulkner Browns and cost £10 million to complete. The newly refurbished Monument Mall opened in December 2013. Gone was the food court and internal layout of shops. Instead, the mall was turned inside out. All shops now had their own front door to the street. This conversion saw the central atrium and the space under the dome converted into two new restaurants. Upon reopening, the mall was fully let again. Overall, this redesign has been successful. Monument Mall attracts some of the most upmarket brands in the city. It continues to have a low vacancy of units. However, the refurbishment is not without its flaws. Previously, the windows on the western corner of this were designed to appear similar to sash windows to fit in with the surrounding streets. However, the refurbishment replaced all of these. Secondly, and the largest bugbear of the refurbishment, was that this mall previously had an internal bin store located within it. Since the refurb, the bin store was removed, leading to each individual retailer having a wheelie bin stored on Brunswick Court. This has changed the street into a rather unattractive one, but what happened to the previous links into the Monument Metro? The link connecting into the Fenix store still exists and can be accessed to this day. However, the link through to the Monument Mall has been replaced with a Sainsbury store built underground. The Green Market was historically a vibrant street market located next to St Andrew's Church on Newgate Street. This was later moved into an indoor market known as Green Court, built by Richard Granger, before moving again to some sheds located next to Granger Market. A purpose-built market building was finally completed in 1976, linking in with the Eldon Square Shopping Centre. The Green Market was located around a central atrium with skylights. Away from the atrium, individual units were located over two floors. The finishing materials were distinctive tan colour tiles. Shopping centre projects at the time still valued markets as elements of these, and this can be seen in other city centre shopping centres, such as the Bull Ring in Birmingham, in its original rendition. As part of the redevelopment of the city of Birmingham, the largest and most advanced shopping centre in the world has risen on the historic site of the old Bull Ring. If you've got an eye and an ear for a bargain, you can do a deal here in true curbside style. But for at least one of them, that could be about to change. The ball ring has become a symbol of everything that was wrong with planning in the 60s, but soon it'll be demolished and its concrete collar broken. In four years' time, there'll be a new three-storey building, a new site for the open markets, two new department stores and a 3,000-vehicle car park and bus station. Eldon Square needed to keep up with the times, and in January 2007, the green market was demolished to make way for an extension to Eldon Square. £170 million pounds has been spent on transforming Eldon Square from a pioneering shopping centre of the 70s into a development still at the forefront of British retailing into a fifth decade. 
new mall is named after St Andrew's Church, its neighbour across the street. And this is really providing some retailing at an end of the scheme which was pretty weak. And to find that retailers of the status here prepare to move to this part of the scheme with the confidence they have really thrills me. The centrepiece of the new St Andrew's Way phase is Debenhams, 175,000 square feet of state-of-the-art retailing. It's going to have the newest and the best of everything that Debenhams has to offer. Mal level, 23 new retail units, and every one of them has been taken with really good, high-quality retailers. So I would say it's gone pretty well. Now, in 2024, this extension to Eldon Square is struggling. Its anchor unit of Debenhams closed alongside a number of other units. Plans were recently submitted for a new entertainment venue to take up half this unit and be constructed on the rooftop of the shopping centre. This shows the major change from retail focus to now having to expand into leisure uses. The loss of the green market to construct the modern extension to Eldon Square was done under the promise of a new green market, which never came to fruition as it was considered too expensive. This has left only one market hall in the city centre of Granger Market. One of the largest unbuilt proposals was known as the Geordie Ramblers, named after Barcelona's renowned tree-lined promenade. In 2005, the Terry Farrell partnership produced a master plan for Newcastle. This would connect a series of quarters of the city, linking Exhibition Park, Newcastle Uni, the city centre and the East Quayside together. As part of the scheme, a new Selfridges or Harvey Nichols store was proposed. This would have fronted Pilgrim Street on the site of the former Royal Arcade which as highlighted earlier was a retail location that failed for a century due to its edge of centre location. This scheme was ultimately never built. The economic crash of 2008 might have been a factor in this. The site of Pilgrim Street was finally developed in the early 2020s with a new office tower and food hall. This revised scheme did mean that the Warswick Chambers building was retained and restored. Another proposal on Pilgrim Street that never made it to the planning application stages was a retail-led mixed-use development. This would have been located where the HMRC offices are currently under construction. A few renders were released of this, which didn't really reveal very much about the overall scheme. A facade consisting of glazing and an expressed frame was the only real detail shown. A tower element could also be seen with balconies that looked to be approximately 20 storeys in height, located at the eastern end of the site. We know this was being designed by the local firm of Ryder Architects. Michelle Percy, the council's director of place, raised concerns of this in March 2021, stating that a second mall in the city would tear the heart out of Eldon Square. This scheme was later shelved, and a revised scheme was proposed by Taris Properties for HMRC to relocate from their existing Long Benton site to the city centre. This proposal is now office-led, with a number of retail leisure units proposed on the ground floor facing Pilgrim Street, and is currently under construction. Newcastle's retail future is now a precipice. It's unlikely I will ever see a new mall built in the city in my lifetime. Regarding its existing ones, Eldon Square has recently unveiled plans to focus much more on leisure uses with go-karting and a music venue proposed. This proposal will see the vacant Debenhams building replaced with a mixture of leisure uses. This is at a time when there is a large amount of vacant retail floor space in the mall. The hope is that leisure uses will save the Eldon Square Mall. However, just across the road from the vacant Debenham store is the early 2000s development of The Gate, a leisure venue featuring bars, restaurants, casino and cinema. This venue also has a number of vacant leisure units. The successes of these schemes will fall down to whether the city has this much demand for leisure units. <laughs>